So the what I thought with the learning objectives um, for this chapter were kind of insane. So it's everything from learning the vocabulary of things out through um, actually doing some some machine learning, some statistical learning with KNN. Um, there's a lot of discussion about error. There's an introduction to parametric and non-parametric. You can read the list, but the short version is in my head, every major topic in machine learning and or statistical learning is covered here. So, um, where, Raymond, yo, there's a request to increase the size of the font. Yeah, if you can just control plus a couple of times, will do. <laughs> Thank you. I'm trying to see where my chat went. Oh, it's over oh. there. <laughs> Ah, uh, you know. Okay. How's that? That is fantastic. Cool. Okay, so um, many, many topics. Um, full disclosure, um, I'm a teacher in biostat, and I'm planning on using the book in the summer. And so my notes are pretty um, darn extensive, and I write in uh, Markdown for a living, or in R Markdown for a living. Um, so a couple of things to note, I added on at the end an appendix um, for those of you who don't do book down and it just goes through and it, it has like how to do all kinds of stuff for like taking pretty notes. Basically, I've been building up this document um, for, I don't know, a year or two. So everything that I want to put in my notes is here. Um, so help yourself um, if you want to write out stuff. Um, I also noticed one of the things that's missing in this book is an a like a glossary or an abbreviation list. And so I started to build that out as well. So there you go. So many, many details. Um, the chapter starts out with a gentle introduction talking about an advertising example where they walk through and... Um, show three different potential predictors. Um, I don't know what you thought of this, but I found myself thinking, okay, this is how every stat book should start is with a, a good applied example. Um, and again, the, it starts out by just showing a couple of regressions, scatter plot with regression lines, and they jump into terms. And the terms are, um, I didn't think too bad. So they talk about input and output variables, um, in my world, the independent, dependent variables, but they, they lay out a whole bunch of useful vocabulary. I didn't think this part was, was too nasty. Um, what do you guys think? Are these the terms that you're used to seeing? So like I'm used to talking about features in independent and dependent variables. Is that the world you guys live in? Also predictors and response um, for me. Yeah. Features, more mostly features. Yeah. So from the gentle introduction, um, they lay out, oh man, it's not going to keep my screen size. They go between pages. That stinks. Um, <laughs> they go to the arguably the most general formula in the history of math, <laughs> where you say, or history of statistics, where there's an outcome Y, which is predicted with something something which can have any form and the prediction um, will end up with some error. And I think the key thing here is they, they introduce the concept of system, systematic or um, yeah, systematic information versus error. So this is like the thing that you can optimize. This is the thing that you can improve upon by using different algorithms but there's always some leftover error. Um, and they start to break that down um, through the rest of the chapter and the rest of the book. Um, they introduce error terms with this lovely plot where um, they show the truth as a blue line and then error measurement um, or error um, in the assessment across all of the different data points. Um, I think it's a lovely graphic to introduce what epsilon is, the idea of you can't make a perfect for prediction for whatever reason. 
Siram, you had a question? Uh, no, I just wanted to suggest for the font, if you click on the toolbar above the A thingy, then you can increase the size of font for the whole book. Where do I do that? Uh, just at the top of your book, after your title. It's so one the of right. the Zoom. Yeah. Ah. You can click it a few times. Dude, thank you. Uh, that is super helpful. Thank you. <laughs> You're hired, man. <laughs> In Shamsudan, did you have a question or comment? Yeah, yeah. So can you uh, talk a bit about um, how does this errors, some, uh, the mean of the errors uh, uh, becomes zero? Because the book says that um, these um, vertical lines are errors and their mean equals to zero, right? Yeah, so, so the idea is if, if a, a model, um, I mean, I wanna make sure I get the words right, but the idea is that some of the times the, the model will, will be, um, the errors will be above and sometimes they'll be below the line. So on average with, is it an unbiased? I don't think that's the right word, um, but, it, in, in general, sometimes the errors will be positive and sometimes the errors will be negative. And so like in the context of um, regular old ordinary least squares regression, the line is, the, the regression line, the slope of the line is placed so that the average error, average error is zero. So sometimes it guesses too low and sometimes it guesses too high. So, is there a statistician in the house? I get that right? That's correct. A little help. <laughs> um, uh, so basically what, what we're saying is that when we predict a value, you can take that value away from the values in your data set. And that basically creates a mean of zero, leaving you with the residuals, which is the error term. Yeah, right on. So predicted minus actual, um, add them up, the average should be zero. Shamsudan, did I get that? Is that cool? Yep, yeah. Okay. Um, so there's errors, even though they're not what most people would call errors. It's just slight inaccuracies in the estimate. Um, and they, they, they go into, if you have a given example with two um, predictors, so predicting income, I think, with years of education and seniority. And the idea is, um, what they're showing here is that you can fit a plane or they'll get into to different things. You, you can fit an estimate through the data and in however many dimensions, there's still gonna be um, errors. And the whole point of the book is to come up with different ways to generate a surface like this. Um, so they start out with ordinary least squares regression and then go into, um, I think it's, is it, pain, is it beta spline? No, it's not splines into low S curves. I can't remember. We'll get there. Um, talk about the, why bother estimating F? Why, why bother estimating that function? You can either care about prediction or inference. Um, and for prediction, you're trying to actually, you're focusing on um, the, the outcome, the outcome variable, and you have some function, some form of magic, which comes up with the predictions. Um, and in the case of prediction, you're not, you don't care about what this is. Um, you don't care about the, like the, the form of it, so long as it gives you good estimates. Um, in, in my, so I, I do biostat and in, in my world, there's times when I'm, I'm making predictions like trying to guess whether or not someone is gonna live or die. I don't really care um, what's going on in here so long as it will give me good estimates of, of the y hat. Um, 
that has a big caveat of, I may have a great predictive model, but if I'm only paying attention to the prediction and I don't look at the variables, I don't have a good idea about when it's going to fail. I don't think it's one of the things they didn't really talk very much about is if you only focus on prediction, you actually are missing out on part of the story. But any thoughts, questions, comments, complaints? The silence is deafening. <laughs> um, then they go into um, the accuracy of the prediction. And this is, I think, a recurring theme for the parts of the book that I've read, read where there is reducible error. So that comes down to, can I fit a different, different kind of model, a different machine to make my prediction? Um, by fitting the different machines, then I can reduce the reducible error but at the end of the day, there's going to be irreducible error left over. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. And I think they talked about, you know, reasons for that are like there could be unmeasured variables um, or I don't think they mentioned it, but like it could be just a, a measurement error. So the, the ruler slipped, the person sneezed, um, that kind of stuff. But the big picture here is that there's an important distinction between the reducible error and the irreducible error <clears throat> where the goal is to come up with the best predictive model or the, the most accurate model by reducing the reducible error. Um, um, and then they do it in math <laughs> um, and, and talk about um, the focus of the book is on estimating F, so estimating some mysterious function that will minimize the reducible error, what I just said. And it's important to keep in mind that there's always going to be error left over. Error, for every practical case, there'll be left over error. Um, and you don't know how good you're doing in practice. Yep, go ahead, Shamsuddin. Shamsuddin. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, uh... This part that you are showing, um, the part of the book says it is important to keep in mind that irreducible error will always provide an upper bound on the accuracy of our prediction. This bound is almost always unknown in practice. I don't actually quite get this um, point. I couldn't hear you at the very end there. Hello, hello, can you hear me? Uh huh, just didn't hear the very end. Okay. I said the book is said it is important to keep in mind that irreducible error will always provide an upper bound on the accuracy of our prediction for why. This bound is almost always unknown in practice. What does this statement mean? So you, you don't ever know, unless you have simulated data, you don't know how good of a job you're doing. So if you're making predictions, um, you don't know how off you you actually are so like again like if the you're you're measuring someone's height the 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 ruler or the the tape measure um may be off a little bit just because like for random reasons so there could be measurement error left over um even even if you're doing everything right there still can be some noise okay. and so even if you had, you know, the best possible ruler or the best possible tape measure, mm. there still will be some some error left over. Um, okay. And again, you know, with the, the there's no way to know just how far off you are. So, and you know, you, you can't you can't assess the truth unless you actually know the truth. <laughs> yeah. and, so in practice, you never really know just how far off you are. Thank you. Yep. What's up, Brett? Uh, I, was, I was just gonna follow on on uh, Sham's question. Um, so if I'm thinking about it right, the reducible error is the error that it comes from not using the perfect model. Yeah. So, and if you use the perfect model, all that's left is the irreducible error. Is that right? Yeah, that's totally how I see it. Okay, yeah. cool. Thank you. Yeah, so like if the data is actually, if, if you had a scatter plot and the data is actually a curve, 
you could put a straight line through it and you'll have a lot of error left over. But then if you put like the best curve through the curve data, you're still going to have some wiggle room around the curve. And so the idea is to find the right form to get the closest um, shape to the actual data, be it like the curve in a scatter plot or the plane in a, in a two or three dimensional space. But yeah, totally. Same way of thinking about it. Um, just a follow up with Brake, and um, he talked about the model. So, what about if we use a model that perfectly fit the data, and um, it somehow overfit the data? So, in that case, do we have an um, irreducible error because um, it seems the model is performing wonderfully? I can just barely hear you. I'm sorry. Is it me or can is is he super quiet? A little bit you, quiet, but not too bad. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yep. Yep. Um, I said um just um, follow up with what Brett said. So I think Brett was saying if we use a good model, um the irreducible error is so small, right? So what about if we use um a, a model with uh, that perfectly fits the data? Do we have irreducible error in that sense? So if you said, if you use a perfect model, do you still have irreducible error? error? Because the model fits the data very well. That isn't maybe if we use model that even overfit the data. So it, it matches every point and quite well. Do we have, irreduci do we have error in that sense? So, that is a, um, can I? Yeah. That is actually called what is called the overfitting issues. Cause if the, if the, that regression line or kind of a, you can, you can draw the line between the two points perfectly, then might be have a no irreducible error term can be happen. But the thing is the problem of the overfitting issues is you can hardly interpret the, what's the relationship or how, how those axes can be play low to predict to why. So that is what is called the overfitting problem. Yeah, yeah so like it, if you're doing physics, you, and you're like measuring at the level of, of like the atom, you can probably get rid of um, basically all of the irreproducible um, error because you'd have such an insanely good representation of the truth. But it, with any model, which isn't run on like the population, um, you'd never have a perfect, perfect model. And you wouldn't know what, <laughs> if, if you have irreproducible or reproducible error left over. Um, so like the, the, the issue with overfitting, you could like get a perfect prediction of your sample and that would have no um, reproducible error. It'd be like a perfect fit of the sample. Um, but most of the time you have error left over in your sample and also you have error left over because your sample isn't the population. I don't know, what do you guys think? That Was that English? <laughs> Well, and there's, there's always some amount, like even in your physics example, like there's um, uh, uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle, like you literally cannot know the exact right answer. Um, so there's like defined irreducible error in physics, even when you get down to the minimum error, there's a minimum and it's not zero. And so even there you have irreducible error that you can't you just there, you know, there is some level in everything. There's some level of things that you just can't know. And that's what the irreducible error is about. Um, you really have two possibilities there. Either you have completely defined the generating function of the data, you know, in which case if you have like one plus one equals two, you can mathematically define that. Or what is far more likely is uh, your, you have overfit the data. You know, you, you have, you have uh, made some assumptions in your modeling that will not bear out in real life, in production. 
So if you, if you get your error down to zero, um, either you um, have succeeded beyond all reasonable expectations, or you probably have made an error in your modeling. And it is far more likely you have made an error in your modeling. <laughs> Can I just add one one thing here? Hi, Please. can you? Yeah. Uh, so, based on all this discussion, I thought uh, the question was really interesting. So, if we forget about the fact that the model that we will fit will not be usable in practice and it may not be good for anything, but just on a very theoretical level, when we think about this error that part of it is reducible, part of it is irreducible, I had never really thought about this, and I think. This discussion is making me wonder if by overfitting, even by overfitting and forgetting about the fact that that may not be usable at all, can we just make both the reducible and the irreducible components absolutely zero? And I'm not sure, like, if, if we don't get into the physics of it, that will make it physically impossible for us to do that. Uh, in a different example, let's say I had uh, data on the entire population. Could I then, in principle, uh, make my reducible and irreducible components both zero? Just as an interesting theoretical question, more than a practical question. I, I, I don't think that's possible. And the reason why it's not possible is because you might have the population at an instance of time, but you don't have the population at all times. Thereby, the dimensionality of your data is compounding the amount of error that you can actually take into your your um your function and I, I think it's also important to keep in mind that you know if you have the entire population measurements the actual reality you don't need a model in that case you know you can directly measure the thing the whole point well a point of modeling is because you cannot actually go out and get the information directly. So you cannot directly infer, you cannot directly tell what people's preferences are for a website or get a arbitrary person's height to the precision that you want on demand. And so you have to come up with some way to uh, explain the causal factors and to uh, estimate the, the thing you're trying to predict. Yeah, I'll, I think I'll we might get into this a little bit more when we talk about parsimonious models as well. Totally. Actually, all those points are like awesome. Yeah, actually in practice, like uh, in this part, we actually talking about the predicting something, right? So in that case, even if we can, we based on the, our data set, and then we can develop the model for the predictions. Uh, or maybe we, if even if we can, uh, develop the model that perfectly fits the, our data set, but for the predictive purposes, it that does not necessarily guarantee the predictive outcome gonna be the perfect when when the new data set comes in. Because uh, the predictive purpose is the when whenever we have a new data set, we can that model should be perfectly predict the outcome even if we can get the new data set and then uh, adding that data. But in the practice, even if we can, based on the, our current existing sample, data sample, even if we can succeed it in the developing the perfect predictive model, whenever we have a new data set or what is called the test data set comes in, in the machine model process, that does not necessarily guarantee that our model is gonna be produced the perfect fit for the those new data set in in the practice perspective. That is yeah. also another reason can be maybe in a practice perspective, practical perspective, that is always have a irreducible errors comes in. And also the I when what I know about the these kind of purposes, so our goal gonna be as as mentioned in, in this slide, like uh, minimizing the, those errors, what is called the cost function of the regression model for the predictive purposes. Yep, totally makes sense. The, uh, the other piece is um, there's always measurement error. You know, st statistics, everything I've ever done, you know, you, you pretend that there's no measurement error, but there is always measurement error. And so even with the best possible model you know that will perform great on this sample and on every every possible future sample 
there's always measurement error. And so that's gonna end up in the irre irreproducible part. All right, yeah. Um, it has been pointed out that we're gonna be coming back to this a lot throughout the book. So we should probably go ahead and move on and we'll have more examples as we go. Cool, so, I can't yeah. see my chat, so. <laughs> no problem. Yell at me. Um, so with inference um, is more than just making about, is more than just thinking about predictions. It's about getting into which predictors matter, how good, um, um, what's the relationship between the predictors and the outcome um, and the predictors and themselves. And so it's about measuring the relationship and then like how good of a job do you do um, in describing the relationship? I don't know what else to say. I mean, it's, it's getting at like what's going on behind the curtain to, to start to get at inference, to understand which predictors are actually driving the effects. Um, and from there, they, they start to talk about linear models. Um, so what everybody learns in Stats 101, get a scatter plot, put a straight line through it, um, and then put a curve through it and pretend that the curve is, is linear because it's a linear model, which always makes my head spin. Um, um, and I think they get into the, the, so they talk about linear models, um, an ordinary least squares linear models is being an example of a, a parametric model. I don't know how many times they come back to this formula, but I think a lot. Um, the idea is you, you have a baseline level and then for every one unit increase in the first predictor and the second predictor and every other predictor, um, the outcome changes by some amount. So you can have an arbitrary number of predictors um, feeding in to make this function. Um, so the classic parametric model and the idea here is, so this is ordinarily squares and you have um, an outcome Y, which is approximately equal to the truth. So if you actually knew what the truth was for the, the intercept when all of the predictors are zero, if you actually knew what the truth was for the impact of the first predictor, so there's no hats on these. So the idea is um, you can approximate Y based off of the truth. And this is approximate again, because the irre irreducible error is still floating around. And they talk about the advantages. Um, I don't know if any of you tried to do this by hand, but they say it's easier. <laughs> so, Trying to fit an ordinary least squares regression method is supposed to be easy unless you're doing it on an exam. Um, it's simpler um, because you only are trying to approximate a few things. Um, the disadvantage is it's not particularly flexible and it can only account for certain shapes. So you can put a straight line, you can put a curve, you can put a bunch of... Um, align with a bunch of different curves, but there's a limited number of shapes you can apply. Um, and they, I think this is where they first mentioned overfitting, um, where the idea being you follow a particular set of data too closely so that you pay attention to what you think is signal, but you're actually modeling or predicting noise. Um, And I, again, this is, I, I said it a couple of times, but this is like where they talk about you're using some F, some function um, to make your prediction. And it may turn out that that prediction um, is quite poor. And with a parametric model, like a linear model, there's a whole lot of shapes and a whole lot of patterns. It can't actually fit very well. Uh, and then they come into this, I, I love this, this like, I think this is wicked cool to think about trying to come up with a prediction and, and looking at it as a plane. Um, and in this case, they show um, some, I can kind of see it from the picture. Sometimes you guess low, sometimes you guess high. 
um, but they're fitting a straight line or they're fitting a, a flat a plane through the data. Um, and you can see it's not quite right. And then they start to go into non-parametric methods where you can take that plane um, and make it wiggly. And the advantage is um, there's no assumptions made about the shape of the F, the shape of the function. So like in the first, in, with the last thing, you make the assumption that the data can be described by a plane and then you relax that assumption um, and you can make that the plane as wiggly as you want. And they talk about the disadvantages. It requires more data to get a good fit on the, the wiggliness of the data. Um, that's right. And then they show splines and they talk about um, you can fit a spline with different amounts of flexibility to it. And I suspect that most of the book is going to be about trying to come up with just the right amount of flexibility in all of the predictive models. Um, I don't know. I thought this was cool. Did anybody else, has anybody else like thought about it this way in terms of fitting mountains to a space? Mm. All right. I thought it was good. Cool. It is very cool. Uh, Shamsuddin had a question about uh, how to make these plots. Um, he asked in ggplot, I don't think ggplot can do 3D surfaces, and there have been questions. I've never done 3D surface plots, so um, we'll have to take that offline, but I suspect their code for this is available somewhere, so we could see how they make these plots. I've looked. I, I like I like stalked Tib Sharani and Hasty and tried okay. to find the code for the book. And I haven't given up yet, but yeah, I <laughs> totally agree. It'd be really, really cool to if instead of having just like the lab, they actually yeah. gave us the book down so we could make these. Uh yeah, GM Contour does do uh something like this apparently although no never mind that's just 2d it's not 3d representations okay yeah so that's not that's not it um but there are 3d uh yeah there's some stuff for plotly in the chat and there have been extensions for ggplot i know there are a couple of different packages that can do it so um so the answer, I guess, to the actual question, how to make this in ggplot, you, you can't. Um, you have to use other packages to do it. Don't say you can't. You can do everything in ggplot. It's just, will the sun burn out before you figure it out? <laughs> <laughs> well, you need extensions to ggplot. Like, uh, yeah. well, okay, yeah, you might have to like kind of basically hand draw it, but don't do that. <laughs> Several weeks later on Stack Overflow. <laughs> somebody's and, figured it out somewhere yeah there's that's uh, how i live my life <laughs> someone mentioned ray shader in uh in chat ray shader yeah. can definitely do this kind of thing there i've seen other packages so if you're really interested we can take that into the slack to sort out sort through some examples let's do it <laughs> <laughs> okay um so then they talk about um predictive accuracy and interpretability and stress the idea that with relatively simple restrictive models, like the ordinary least squares regression thing, the parameters are relatively easy to interpret and they walk through or they, they lay out a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of different machines that I guess will eventually be, we will be learning along the way so they, they start out with the, the least squares, which starts out, it's pretty inflexible. Um, and then go through lasso and gams. Um, so basically you can fit more and more complex um, shapes, but at the expense of losing the audience or losing the ability to interpret what the models mean. And I've done some stuff with gam and you get equations back and yeah, does a great job. It does a great job predicting, but then trying to unpack what the shape of the, what the, the math actually means is insane. Um, 
and things like bagging and boosting and support vector machines just more and more complicated to get to the point where you have to do so much work to understand what it's actually doing anyway um cool then okay then they make the distinction between supervised and unsupervised learning so most of the stuff or everything to this point in the book is all about supervised where there is a truth that you're trying to approximate and they mention unsupervised like the idea of clustering where you um, have some data and you don't know how the individual points are related to each other. If I remember right, the, the pictures are showing um, groupings of tumor cells, I think. And so you have an algorithm that tries to clump them together into different groups. And um, I think the, the one on the left, uh, I can't remember. So this is like an easier problem, but anyway, with unsupervised learning, there is no truth that you know. Uh, you're just trying to find what is related to everything else. Is that was that English? So two two people nodding. All right. Um, they go into the distinction between um, quantitative and qualitative, so categorical versus continuous variables. Um, they introduce um, the idea of different classes. Um, so there can be categorical or continuous predictors and categorical or continuous outcomes. Both are in play. And for model accuracy, um, the, the famous, there's no free lunch. So th there is no correct modeling method depends on your data. Um, I've, I've heard a lot of people talk about the no free lunch and how it's like the gift from the gods for people who do data science, because there's always one more thing to try. Um, you never know if you're going to get it right. And so you can keep asking for more money because you may be able to come up with a better model. Yeah, there's some cynicism. Um, Okay, so the idea is you can fit lots of models um, and you don't know in advance what is the best model. So then how do you assess um, what is the best model? First thing, the first metric that they talk about is the mean squared error. Um, love the formula. <laughs> um, it's take the difference between the point in the predicted point, square it um, and calculate the average. So it goes back to that, the, the curve at the beginning where there was the errors up and down, take the distance between the points in the, the S-shaped curve, take that distance and turn it into a square, add up all of those little squares, and that's the metric for deciding um, how good a model fits. And so like, this is the magic behind ordinarily squares regression and, and optimizing to find the best curve or the best line. There's a question in the chat um, of why mean squared error versus root mean squared error. So I cannot think in squared <laughs> units. So uh, I'm, I'm pretty cool. I'm okay thinking about how off a height is in inches, but I'm not okay thinking about how off a height is in squared inches. So this thing, because it has the squared term in it, the answer comes back um, in squared units. And I, again, I can't think about what that actually means. If you take the square root of it, it gets it back to the original units. Is that, that okay? Make sense? Yep, I think that uh, that covered it. Cool. So um, talk about um, mean squared error, then they get into um, training and test. Um, so when you fit a model, you can calculate the mean squared error on that sample, but you really don't care about that sample. You care about ultimately what's the performance um, in the real world, in, in the truth, as opposed to in the sample. 
And so they, they suggest that you can build a model on one data set and then verify it on another data set. So that would be um, the test data where you find out what is the average um, error, the average, um, how much you're off in your estimates in a new data set is what we actually care about. And go into overfitting. Um, I don't know about you guys and gals, but this made my head hurt for a solid forever. <laughs> You know, for, for a solid while, trying to sort out what they were showing here. Um, short version, is, so like the gray lines are showing the squared error in the training data set as you make your models more and more complicated. So the idea like in this, you can add more wiggle to the line as you add more wiggle to the line, you're going to do better and better at predicting the training data. But by putting in the extra wiggliness, it will hurt you when you fit the data to a new sample. And so that's what this is showing is that the, the squared error decreases and then increases um, when you're applying an overly complicated model um, to new data sets. Um, I think this would make more sense if they'd done it in the other order. Um, so the middle ones um, based on a, a, a linear data set and the um, first one is actually based on a data set with uh, one order of polynomial. So it's uh, got one uh, additional degree of freedom, which is what causes that curve. And then the, the one at the bottom has, um, has, I believe, two extra ones so the point be the whole point to, is to show that as you increase the uh, amount of freedom in the model that the amount of error that it can explain is increased but it depends on the data that's being fitted to so in the case of the linear one because we've got a linear uh, tr a linear data set which is based on as you increase the degrees of freedom the it still fit over fits, but it becomes more error prone. But it, even for the first two, it's reasonably speaking the same. It doesn't really change too much. Whereas when we actually have a lot more um, uh, uh, variation in the actual data itself, if we add more degrees of freedom, it moves more and therefore the error is completely decreased. But the whole point is like when we go back to two, when we go back to what is equivalent to 2.9, is that when we've um, which is probably the best example here. If we just put, fit a linear line through it, it's not a very good, um, not very good model. So what we have there is an example of bias in the model because, the, because it's not fit close enough to the data. Does that make sense? Yeah. So like this, this the top one. This is if you put the straight line here, it's it's badly biased because it doesn't fit the data well. Um, but and you, you need the more complicated curve here. And so the question becomes, how do, how do you make it complicated enough, but not too complicated? I don't know that I, I found this, pres this part of the presentation really confusing. I mean, I, I think I got it now, but was this like crystal clear for everybody else and it was just me or was this hard? definitely um from the chat it looks like you know we have some more people who are starting to see the light on it um i think the general i like i really like the visual representation of overfitting basically that you know you can see those green dots um you know on, on an individual basis the whole set together has more you know, the three plots are a little um, harder to take in, I think. Yeah, totally. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. I also just think that the different colors are hard to see here. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. Okay. So then they talk about degrees of freedom is the idea of being um, a way to quantify how flexible the models are. So I think August... I think you said degrees of freedom. So as you can add more complexity, 
add more wiggliness to the line. It's the equivalent of adding more degrees of freedom or using more degrees of freedom. Um, and the idea of overfit um, is where you, you should have used a less flexible model um, where the, the, or you should have used a simpler model, I guess would be a better thing to say. Um, so if you had used a simpler, less flexible model, um, you would have had better performance on the test data. And so again, here's the, the test MSE, as opposed to just um, talking about the MSE of the training data. I see a hand go up. No. Okie dokie. How are they quantifying flexibility, the number of parameters? Yeah, so back in the last picture, like the straight line, that's not flexible at all. And, but then I can't remember how they were fitting this, but there's like the different degrees of wiggliness here. So there's like a, a blue line, which is really tightly paralleling the black line. So that's, more flexible or the really, really overly flexible green line here, which is too flexible. Okay, cool. Looks like I got that right. And I found my chat window. Go me. Ah, it's a little things. Um, okay, so that's the, what we were just talking about. Um, yeah, love this. <laughs> um, so they give the equation for the, the bias variance trade-off. Um, I don't know, when I think about this, I always go back to the, the, the picture like this, where you have in fact a curve. And if you fit it with a straight line, that is a badly biased model. It's, it's off from the truth. But if you have, in fact, this curve and you were to fit it over and over and over again with a straight line, those straight lines are all gonna be pretty much in the same neighborhood. So there's not gonna be a whole lot of variability in the line, okay? So if, if you're fitting this, this truth with samples over and over and over again, you're gonna pretty consistently have a line at about this, with about this slope. It's gonna be wrong, <laughs> but it's gonna be consistent versus if you were to fit the squiggly line, um, it would, there would be a lot of different, on each sample, it would be about right, about right but there would be a lot of variability in exactly the shape of the squiggles um, across resamples. So the bias variance trade-off is some models give you a better fit, so less bias versus the truth, but at the expense of being, um, there being a lot of very subtle variability between the models. So that's how I interpreted it. I personally didn't, I didn't, this didn't work for me very well, other than the fact that, okay, cool. You can break it apart into variance, um, variance across the samples, bias, which is inherent, but across the samples. Um, and then there's always leftover error, um, but it's, I thought the section was kind of cool because they talked about using a large number of training sets to try and approximate how much bias you have versus the variance across the samples. Um, and the holy grail is to find um, a method that achieves both low variance and low bias. So it's close to the truth. So it's low bias and low variance. It's always, it comes up with a consistent pattern across resamples. How am I doing? Yeah. I got one thumbs up, one nodding. All right. Clearly I've understood this book. 
Thank you, another thumbs up. Or we've all reached the same errors. And there's a bias variance thing right there. <laughs> Consistently wrong, right on. <laughs> um, okay, and this goes back to that previous graphic. Um, and this one really makes my head hurt. Um, but again, there's a trade-off between the bias and the variance that different degrees of flexibility in different models afford. Um, and so again, the challenge lies in finding a method for which both the variance and the squared bias are low. So that was all in predicting a continuous outcome. Um, and then they hop over and mention you can play similar games with classification. What's the question? Well, I was just, uh, we're getting close to time. So if there is a good break point, we should take it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we. I don't think we're going to quite make it to the end. And we have the, the lab to go over anyway. Um, so we'll still be in this arena next week. Uh, just wanted to alert you to the time. <laughs> I'm not paying attention. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Kostov, do you have a question? Yeah, actually, on the previous slide where you showed those three charts, I think it was figure 2.12. Yeah. So I was just, when I was going through this section, so basically with increased flexibility, there comes this inflection point where the variance term increases. But I noticed that the bias term, it's like monotonically reducing, probably like it's reducing as flexibility is increasing. But I was just wondering, like, if flexibility is increasing, probably we are like overfitting. So wouldn't the bias also go up? Like if you are overfitting, like we are fitting to the noise in the data and then we test it out on a new sample, it could be that we get a higher bias as opposed to a less flexible model. Like, any thoughts there? I don't have good thoughts about that. It's a dandy of a question. Anybody got any insights? Maybe the sample bias versus population bias is what you're talking about. So if you overfit, you get the nature of the sample data quite a bit. So you still get the low bias, I would think. Mm -hmm. But when we're testing, is it like, Probably I might be getting something wrong, but in this chart, are we still testing on the sample data or are we like fitting the model on the sample data and then testing on a new data point, which is coming from the population? That's a great question. Somebody send them an. Somebody send the uh, authors the question. I, I don't know. This might be the answer for you to your question. But the thing is, in the what I what I know about the machine learning process, it is actually we actually divided our data set into the two parts. Sometimes three parts, like a training and testing, and sometimes like a three parts. I don't know what the, the other one, but. Maybe when we train the model by using the train data set, and then, uh, we can apply to the that uh, evaluate the validity of the model by using the test data set. That actually, in 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 that process, actually there is uh, some kind of a trade off going to be happen like a bias and the various kind of things. Because when we new data set comes in. There is a definitely has an error term, and you know, there might be also have a lot of a variance, like a, as a noise for the predictive or some kind of a classification error or error going to be happen in the new data set. Mm -hmm. But in by uh, doing the those kind of a going back and forth between the those two process, we can keep we have to judge about the trade off, what kind of a trade off we have to prefer. Uh, based on the our research question in the in the model or some kind of a hypothesis we define in the first process of the research 
And then the other thing is, even if you have a population data set, there is also, maybe we can talk about this later in the book, I guess. Maybe there is a lot of uh, what is called the resampling method. Like uh, we can divide in the population data into the train and test the data set by using different kinds of resampling methods, such as the kind of a K-fold or some kind of a bootstrapping kind of a resampling method. By using those kind of a sampling methods, we can divide it into the data set to the one for the training and one for the testing, and then to keep evaluating our model and then keep evaluating the, some kind of a trade-off or how we can choose the, these kind of a biases and biases problem going back and forth to the uh, uh, using the, those training and test data set. Cool. I think we're out of time. John, what, what do you want to do for... Yeah. Um, next time? So next time we've got uh what like six seven seven sections left um if if you can just continue ray and then someone else get ready to start walking us through the lab um that would be awesome um let me see let me look at the book so that i'm through or through the exercises i guess in this case um so i think like ideally we should all kind of work out, work through the exercises and then just kind of make it a group study session of what did we have trouble with? What did we find? What did we see? I'm not sure if anyone, I mean, I, I can lead it, but just in a matter of here's the question, how did everyone do? Um, I know, or I assume not everyone is going to be able to treat this like a real class and necessarily do all the exercises, but if some of us can, that would be good. Um, but yeah, so I think we start with those remaining sections, and if you if you can cover them, Ray, that would be great. Sure. Um, and see what where we get <laughs> as far as exercises go. Like I said, I I know this will take at least two weeks for this chapter, and we'll see next week if we make it through all the exercises and like really understand it. But I do encourage everyone um, to start working through them, and we can use the Slack to do some pre-discussing if anyone's like really stuck or anything like that that is kind of you know that's what we normally do on the rfds slack so uh then we'll see what we'll see what we see <laughs> and i think this will help kind of define what are we going to do through the rest of the book because you know how does it go when we try to work through the exercises i don't know what it's going to be like so we'll see Hey, right. John, John, real quick, um, there's some questions coming up in the Slack about what we'll, what exercises to cover and so on next week. I wonder if you might just address that in the Slack. Yeah, well, so in theory, I think we're going to be able to go through um, all of them. Uh, so, you know, the last few pages of the section or of the chapter, several pages, I guess. Um we might not make it like, you know, make it through everyone. And so we might pick and choose. I don't know yet. I haven't done the exercises, so I'm not sure yet what I think of them. <laughs> um, yeah, it, so, it may be a worthwhile discussion over the course of the week. Yeah. So I think it, like try to, you know, I think try to actually do them and um, we'll see. I, I don't currently have any feel for like how hard they are because I have not attempted the exercises yet. So this week's one's really easy. Uh, it's just okay. Like uh, uh, Emil says, it's basically just an introduction to um, to the labs uh, using R. And they in the book, they use base R, which depends on your opinion about that. Emil has uh, produced this, um, which I suggest right. to use for referencing, but not necessarily to follow. But he hasn't done the first chapter because it's just an introduction. So okay. worth looking at. Okay. Oh, uh, also, there's also a book, I believe, where people have gone out of their way to produce the, the other answers to other questions in the book, because uh, I think Emil's just done the actual uh, R labs and not done right. the uh, conceptual questions. I'm not sure. I haven't looked through it yet. Yeah, it does look like there are um, 
there are a fair number of pretty straight up, you know, no coding um, conceptual questions in this chapter. And so probably we can relatively quickly go through some of those of just there is an answer and we'll talk, you know, why that's the answer or whatever. Um, we'll talk about it more in the Slack because I really don't know and uh, need to get going to another meeting actually. So um, yeah, I will see everyone uh, next week and definitely in the Slack because I think we've got a lot to talk about with, okay, how do these exercises work? So I'll see you all there.